Salam Zahir. Salam Alaikum. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast this week. Um, so I want to get into a little bit about the, I guess, your context with regards to Malcolm X um, and understanding, because you're a, you're a historian, um, which is a term that I haven't heard used in a very long time. Like you only hear it in like Islamic, <laughs> you know, talking about the prophetic times right. kind of stuff. Um, but you're, you're, you're a, a Malcolm X historian. You've worked on the Malcolm X project. You've lectured about Malcolm X and um, other parts of history as well at university. I think it was uni- New York University, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what what is a historian? I know it sounds like a very basic question, but I know there's a lot of nuance there. But also in the right. context of Malcolm X and the conversation we want to have today, um, what's the difference between you know just having a chat about Malcolm X and and why he's important today and and how you've studied and presented him in right. your research and your work. Right. So um, first of all, thank you for having me on. And, you know, I, I guess in thinking about what a historian is, um, it's probably easier for me to answer how I understand history. Um, you know, historians probably some people will say, oh, like someone who is trained in a in a in a discipline working with in a scholarly community. Uh, having peers that review their work, and I did do some of that, um, but you know, my work has my work as a historian has been both in an academic setting and what we would consider public history, which is publicly engaged work. And you know, very simply, um, as a historian, I'm interested in the past and how the past helps inform our understanding of the present, mm-hmm. uh, and also how our understanding of the past reflects our present. And so, you know, when you think about history, the past is fixed. Um, You know, what happened, happened. But how we understand that past is not fixed. That changes by perspective, that changes by time, that changes by location, that changes by identity. We are constantly, even in our own lives, reinterpreting our past in order to make sense of the present. And so, you know, as much as people um, think that the past has lessons for us in the present, um, there is a little bit of a circular thing because the way we see the past is very much influenced by the present. So it's sort of a self-fulfilling, you know, circular kind of exercise. Yeah. We It's a sleight of hand. We say that we are looking to the past to understand the present, but the sleight of hand is the way we look at the past is very much informed by the present. And so, you know, the lessons, quote unquote, that we get from the past will always be applicable to our present because that's, you know, the present determines the kinds of questions we ask about the past. And so, you know, when I, so when I come to uh, someone like Malcolm, I came to Malcolm trying to understand the present. Uh, I was in high school and I used to have to be, used to have to do these book reports in my, um, you know, my in one of my classes, my English class. And there was a list of books that the state that I lived in, you know, determined by its curriculum. Like these are the books that students in this grade level should be reading. And the teacher would have us choose from those books. And when she gave me the list of books, I, I went to her. She was, she was African-American uh, woman. I went to her and I said, you know, I really, I really don't want to read any more books by white people. <laughs> 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 because there was a bias in, you know, what, um, what we were getting. And I wanted to read books that were by black authors. And so she gave me, she sensed, she sensed what was happening behind that question. And she gave me the autobiography of Malcolm X. I went to the school library. I checked it out on a Friday. I couldn't put it down uh, the entire weekend. I read it all the way through. And by Sunday, my mind was just blown. Mm. Um, I had heard of Malcolm X, I had in glimpses and speeches and short short excerpts. I'd heard his name um, growing up, but I didn't know his full story. And um, that that story just and just you know 
it it just gripped me. And so um, that's how I came to Malcolm X was through his autobiography. And one of the things that I liked about Malcolm X that really resonated with me was um, what I would consider a kind of intellectual cool that he brought uh, or that he represented. You know, I was I was a nerdy kid in in school. And I still am a nerdy kid, but I was a nerdy kid in school and uh, very much a history buff. And here was a Malcolm using history in the way that he talked and the way that he thought and using it with such power and such force and such analytical, uh, you know, um, uh, insight yeah. that. I was just like, oh, I want to do that. I want to do what Malcolm is doing with history. Um, and this is so cool. And so that drew me to Malcolm. And then there is the other backdrop of this because I grew up in the late 80s. Um, and this is around the time that hip hop is emerging, uh, especially the genre of hip hop that people would call the conscious hip hop yeah. of people like Public Enemy and Eric B and Rakim and Poor Righteous Teachers and Boogie Down Productions. And they were all referencing Malcolm X. And so here I was, um, you know, discovering Malcolm on my own through reading his autobiography and then encountering Malcolm as a popular culture figure and finding in the intersection of the the nerdiness of history and books and the popular cool of hip hop yeah. and i was just like oh this is a perfect crossroads for me <laughs> I, so that funny. was that's how i came to hip hop i, 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 I mean that's how i came to malcolm I, and hip hop and hip I, I don't feel like there's many people that will kind of have those two intersections in the way that you do um <laughs> meet so perfectly for, for kind of this purpose and, and i think it's awesome I, I think like, you know, from from my perspective and the reason I, I wanted to have this conversation and do this podcast was because um, I listened at the end of last year to um, Lawrence's, Lawrence Fishburne's, um, I want to say rendition, that's not the right word, but, but you know, he, he basically, the, the audible version of Malcolm right. X's autobiography. Right. Um, and I, <laughs> it was one of those things where I always knew that I, I wanted to read this book, but I hadn't up until this point. And the reason I wanted to read it was because as cliche as it is everyone says oh you have to read Malcolm X's biography it's so transformative it's so amazing and and so many people have these kind of um life-changing experiences supposedly reading this book and I was like can a book really do that much you know is, is it really that deep um and and I think for for a lot of people uh, we approach Malcolm X as you say in that kind of pop culture way where it's like through hip-hop or you know people referencing him as a figure in the same way we do uh, Martin Luther King but not really understand so I remember for example at uh, school when we studied uh, U.S. history there was very th th there was um, a, a section on the civil rights struggle and you had like pretty much a paragraph on Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and that was about it um, and then what you see around that is these iconic images and quotes from Malcolm X and I think for a lot of people, that's maybe as deep as it goes. Um, and, and I do want to kind of talk to you a bit yeah. later on about the, the significance of Malcolm X in the Muslim community and with the civil rights struggle and everything else. Um, but but I, I think that that's, there is this kind of personal um, element and journey that comes to it. And I think, you know, when, when you spoke about history and the context of history being defined by the present, so the questions that we're asking, the lens at which we look through history as, as being relevant to the present, I think is is important and fascinating. But um, also, I mean, something you said to me on the phone yesterday as we were kind of discussing this podcast, that I, I wasn't even aware of just even the the narrative in Malcolm X's own autobiography is almost skewed and, and, and directed by what phase of his life he was in. And and again, I, I think for people that aren't aware and, and, and please just cut me off if I'm wrong because you are the historian literally I, I feel very aware of the fact that you are a historian who specializes in talking about Malcolm X and I'm going to try and recite some facts you're doing you. fine you're doing fine <laughs> I haven't said anything yet that's why um but no so, so the, the fact that you know the the Malcolm X that has been almost deified um maybe a strong word but you know ha, has been revered so much is the Malcolm X from the last year of his life 
um, that there's a lot of the kind of the 12 years before that, that's the inconvenient Malcolm almost. Right, um, right. And, and, and so I, I guess just to contextualize his autobiography, if you can talk a little bit about the different phases at which he wrote it and even sure. the fact that it was published after his death. Sure. Um, so yeah, over to you on that, please. So I guess what's interesting is, um, you know, for for many people, the autobiography of Malcolm X is their their first encounter um, with him in any in depth way, and it is a it's a powerful book. Um, Malcolm has a powerful story. It's a story of transformation, and I think just broadly speaking, that kind of narrative is deeply compelling, especially for people who are interested in change, uh, whether that be individual change, community change, or societal change. Those those kinds of changes are all wrapped up in Malcolm's story. And it's told so well, and Malcolm himself was a brilliant storyteller. Um, and then combined with Alex Haley, uh, to whom he told his story and who you know basically assembled the book, uh, is also a brilliant storyteller. And so this is like a one-two punch. And the challenge with having such a powerful text is that it becomes the primary source for people uh, looking to understand Malcolm's life. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but from the perspective of history, you know, we, as I, I think I said before, the past is fixed, but our understanding of the past is in constant reinterpretation is in constant revision. You know, when you and I wake up in the morning, we tell ourselves a story about ourselves that is an interpretation of who we are and what we've done based on that day. A week later, we might tell a slightly different story about ourselves based on where we are. And those differences might seem really slight and small, but five years from now, we will likely tell a very different story, right? And that's because perspective, you know, that the distance of time gives people a kind of perspective where things that they thought were really significant might not be. And things that they overlooked might turn out to be leading up to really significant developments. Mm -hmm. But we just don't know it, you know, because we're in it. And so it's important when we think of, you know, when someone embarks to do like a memoir or an autobiography, one of the challenges for the narrator is to pick a fixed point of reference that I'm going to tell my story from this period in, you know, from this moment, right? I'm going to talk about how I got here. And the challenge with Malcolm's story is there was no fixed point of reference. He was a narrator in dynamic motion. He was constantly moving and changing. And so in his autobiography are multiple, sometimes competing interpretations about his own past. So when he started the autobiography, he intended to write, a, he, first of all, he didn't want to do an autobiography. Alex Haley came to him after having done uh, an article about the Black Muslims as the Nation of Islam was referred to at the time, I think for the, for Reader's Digest, which was a, a periodical. And Alex Haley was like, wow, your story is really interesting. I would really like to do an in-depth you know, book with you. And, and Malcolm deferred. He said, well, the person whose life you really need to study is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And, you know, Alex, who was the leader of the Nation of Islam at the time, and Malcolm and Alex Haley was like, nah, I really want to do you. <laughs> and so Malcolm got permission um, from Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm decided that when he embarked on this project, that it would be for the purpose of uplifting and, and demonstrating the transformative and redemptive power of the Nation of Islam's teachings. That was the first point of reference. And so much of the early versions of his telling of this story are very much geared to that perspective. 
for people who are familiar with Malcolm X's story, by the end of 1963, he had been silenced um, for making comments about Kennedy's assassination and violation of Nation of Islam uh, policy. And, and, you know, both, uh, not both, but many reasons, personal, organizational, and gradually political and theological caused him to eventually leave the Nation of Islam in March of 1964, at least where he publicly announced it in March of 1964. And so his point of reference and his objective for the book changed significantly. It was no longer to, in fact, when he first signed the contract for the book, uh, he had signed it so the royalties would go to the Nation of Islam. And the book was dedicated to, I think, Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. Um, by the time he leaves the Nation of Islam, though, he has to revise the contract. He has a very different objective for this book. Um, and the book then becomes an attempt to reframe um, his life in terms of his new direction, which in part included discrediting the Nation of Islam, right? So now you have two competing perspectives. Um, what's interesting is in 1963, Alex Haley wrote his editor and said, I think we have all we need. I think we're good. We're, we're, we're done. Like we're ready to, you know, send this, put this book together and, and be done with it. And then of course, when these developments happen with Malcolm, he's like, oh, we're, we're not done. This story is not done. And, and so, so you have, you have Malcolm in the Nation of Islam. You have Malcolm outside the Nation of Islam. And then, of course, Malcolm doesn't live to see the completion of the book because he's assassinated in February of 1965, after which point Alex Haley scrambles to put the book together. Yeah including adding an epilogue, which is a, you know, I, I don't know exact page numbers, but it seems like it's about a quarter to a third of the entire text is Alex Haley's epilogue trying to pull all of these pieces together. So now you have Alex Haley's interpretation. So the, the autobiography contains three, at least three interpretive lenses through which one man's history is being told. Uh, is being told. And, I, and, you know, I that gonna, I think, yeah, go I, ahead. I, I, sorry, I was also going to say i think what's what's really interesting uh is that the first i think eight or so chapters of the book are are reflecting on on his life um as detroit red yeah um, as this kind of uh hustler and 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 uh thief and all of these things that he kind of did in his almost former life um and then as he he goes into prison and uh discovers uh the nation of islam it was at a, a point when he was known as satan by fellow inmates um but but i think for myself at least when i was uh, reading or at least listening to Lawrence fishburne um t tell the story so to speak there was this kind of authenticity i i feel at least in the way that he presented um the the beliefs of the nation of islam like you know there were lines and subtle hints where he would mention that oh little did i know uh, right, how much right. this would change but yeah i think what was um really quite significant in the whole thing is that i was able through and, and again he talks about the fact that you know if you want to know a man's story you need to know the whole story which is why he spent a long time talking about a life that may not even be quote unquote relevant um to to the, the second half but but he he believes there is a relevance because you know the context of of everything is really important which is what we've been also discussing right now um but he um what was i gonna say lost my train of thought now what i think we're that? talking about the 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 maybe the representation of the nation of islam or the, yeah yeah that's his it, that's belief it. in the nation yeah so 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 with regards to the, the nation um there were there were thoughts in there that were conveyed that uh painted the white man as the devil and and at a time when he came from a a, a background when um you know the racism was rife socioeconomically black neighborhoods were not doing as well and there were so many different issues that were there in society for people like him to then hear this narrative that the nation of islam had put across that the black uh, sorry the white man is the devil the white man is responsible for all of this stuff um i i think kind of uh suited him if you know what i mean like it gave him an outlet it gave him something to direct all of the hurt and anger and pain of however many years towards do you, do you know what i mean yeah and you know i think um what's what's really important and this is the other one of the other challenges with um 
studying Malcolm X's history is and other singular individuals is that we run the risk of doing what people call great man history, where you feel like the the story of a people or of a phenomena or of a movement can be told through the single story of usually a man. Mm. Um, and what's really important is to note that, you know, Malcolm's story as unique and exceptional as it was, was also exemplary. Um, he was an example of what many people had experienced. And um, that was one of the reasons why his story resonates and resonated so well with people during his life and resonates with people still today, that there were thousands of people who joined the Nation of Islam and even tens of thousands and even more that joined the Nation of Islam as a result of Malcolm's representation of the Nation of Islam. And there were there were many people who remained in the Nation of Islam and continue to join the Nation of Islam even after he left in, you know, what is a, you know, kind of very bitter uh, circumstances that that resulted in his his death. And so the question is not just why did Malcolm you know, be, why was Malcolm drawn to these ideas, but why were these ideas so compelling? And, you know, one of the most powerful um, and I think often misunderstood aspects of the Nation of Islam's theology or theological interpretation is this quote unquote, you know, this notion of the, the quote unquote white man is the devil. And, you know, that Malcolm said it, right? So there's no need to clean up what that mean, what that is. But, you know, I think um, understanding this in the context of what American history had produced. So first of all, and I don't know how deep you want to go into this story. So it's it's often referred to as as, quote unquote, Yakub's history. Because I, I, I was I, I, I wanted to bring this one up because. OK, great. Because for me, to, just like my, my little preamble <laughs> for me, this was uh, the one thing I read in the book that kind of. Um, through me a little bit right because I, right. I don't know much about the nation of islam i know about them more from a political perspective right based on malcolm x's history and right having watched the the netflix documentary series that i believe you feature in as well um about who killed malcolm x and right um when i came across that kind of theological belief of, of was it yakub's yakub um, uh yeah so can you explain that sure and, and sure. you said something to me which i think would be would be nice to also repeat that you know when you look at even Muslim mainstream Islamic theology, some of the uh, the stories, the narrations that we have, the prophetic stories yeah, that we have would yeah. seem just as outlandish to a well, kind yeah. of casual uh, yeah, reader. Yeah, yeah. And so... <laughs> but I, you know, I, I, I think it, it, it's important. Context. No, it's, it's so great. Please, I think it's do, great. Uh, I think go, it's go important. It um, so when I teach this part of the the class and I you know I remember some of the earliest times that I've taught this class I I would see the snickering or hear the snickering and see the reactions on the students are like what what is this story and yeah. you know it's 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 rendered as like an evil scientist who in a genetic experiment created the white race and um for people who aren't familiar with the story it is you know Yakub is Jacob so there is some biblical reference happening there um, and the idea is, or the, the story, and I, I'm giving a very brief, a brief summation, but the idea is that Yakub was a scientist or very, you know, grew up to be a scientist who devised a plan to create a, a very different group of people other than the, his own people. So Yakub is black and part of this included a, a kind of you know, multi-generational birth control eugenics plan that would eventually result in the birth and survival of lighter and lighter and lighter skinned people until you resulted in people who we would consider white um, as a completely new people. And that he, that these people were taught, um, you know, how to rule over the other darker people of the planet. So this is the really, you know, very um, abbreviated version of the story. And 
you know, most people they encounter it just like, what? Like, what is this about? And I think one of the things that I impart to my students is that when you study religion, you know, you can, if you want to, um, study religion from a perspective of subjecting their claims of a religion to archaeological, historical, scientific, you know, examination, and then begin to, you know, dismantle the things that don't align. Um, and and that is, you know, fine, if that's the inquiry you want to do. Um, but that doesn't really tell you anything about how and why religion appeals to people or what the function of the beliefs are for those people. And so the question for me when, you know, as I studied this more was not so much, um, you know, is Yakub's history really true? Mm. But the question was, why did Yakub's history appeal to people and how did it function for the people who believed it? Right. And so um, that, I think, were the more important questions, because those questions lead you to more, I think, sociological truths. I, right. I, I was just I was just going to say that I think f for me, it's the, the sociological impact that's really important and why this story and the, the, the Nation of Islam narrative resonated with Malcolm. Right. And, and I mean, so, even so, sorry, to, just quickly, yeah, even yeah, drawing yeah. on my own kind of um, uh, university experience, because I studied ancient Greek um, history, essentially. And, and we looked at the, the, the gods of the Greeks. Yeah. Um, Zeus, Apollo, Hera, all of these lot. And and again, you know, you can you can as you say, you can approach it from the perspective of okay, so do these gods exist? Yes or no? And I think no, fine. But then understanding the context and the impact that it had on society is really important. So like a lot of the the, the plays, the tragedies, and the comedies that they had, the comedies in particular, um, sought to undermine the, the 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 theological kind of structure they had in place. And it's that's where you can kind of see the texture of a society. Um, and, and so similarly with, with this example here, you've got this story that to the, the casual listener, and, and to be honest, you know, the reason I wanted to talk about it here is because I got really into it. Um, and I remember going on Wikipedia and, and searching and trying to find as much information about this yeah. as I could because I just found yeah. it so fascinating that I'd never yeah. come across this. And I think yeah. most people who have heard of the Nation of Islam have never heard this story either. Or, or they dismiss it, right? Or they use it as a basis to dismiss it. And I mm. think, you know, uh, instead of asking, is this true? The question is, what does this mean? And, you know, so w within religion, there is um, something that people call theodicy, right? And so theodicy is a dilemma, a sort of philosophical dilemma. It comes from two Greek words, theos and dk. Theos meaning God, dk meaning justice. And so the dilemma of theodicy is, how do you explain the existence of evil and suffering in the world in the presence of a just and all powerful God, right? And different people, different traditions have different ways of explaining this. Sometimes people say, oh, it's a trial for purification, or it's a way of God to show his power at the end, or there are all kinds of explanation. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, it, it, those explanations probably work best on in an individual level when people's like oh why am i experiencing this hardship right and so people will think of the story of prophet yunus peace be upon him or jonah right um it's like oh there was someone who you know like lost everything but kept the faith and you know was rewarded and then that's that's you know that works for people on an individual level but i think when you start looking at like massive suffering and evil like the holocaust or slavery um I think you have to be very careful when you start saying that God let something happen mm -hmm. and is just. I mean, there I remember reading about, you know, Jewish theologians and others asking after World War II the question, you know, is God dead? Right? Like, because how could you have I mean, this massive extermination of people, right? Um, just how did that happen? Right? And so, um, when you look at the experience of people who are the descendants of those who were enslaved in the Americas and then specifically in the United States, you know, you, millions of people were subject to this, right? Um, you know, where's God, 
And I think that's a fair question, right? And so the Nation of Islam's answer to that is that white people were given a period of time to rule and this is what they did with it. And, you know, we may say like, oh, that sounds crazy, but part of this story is rooted in in the creation of Adam in the Quran, uh, because so the story of Yaqub, if if you really dig deep into it, so here's here's how the story goes. So Yaqub, when he's a little boy, um, is playing with um, two pieces of of metal and, and or steel, and um, he through his playing he discovers the existence of polar, you know, the the impact of of polar opposites. Mm -hmm. that you know like magnetic forces that in in magnets the similar uh poles uh repel each other but the opposite poles attract right you know this is the basic of magnetics and so in the story yakub's uncle asks him you know yakub what are you doing and yakub says to his uncle i one day i will make a race of people so unlike us that we will fall under their spell and Yakub's uncle says to him and this is the story of Yakub again what will you do except that which will cause mischief and the shedding of blood and Yakub says to his uncle I know what you know not now this is a story that's told of of Yakub now in the nation of Islam's theology right yeah. For people familiar with the Quran, this is the conversation that God is having with the angels, right? When he's just like, I will place a ruler in the earth or a vicegerent that in will the cause earth. cause mischief. Yeah, 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 and and the angels say, well, what would you do except that which will <laughs> cause mischief and the shedding of blood? And, and God says to the angels, I know what you know not. So like we can, you know, again, um, people can quibble with like, oh, are you saying, you know, God was Yaakov? Like, no, that the the, the point is, there is an exchange that that happens where there is an acknowledgement of a the arrival of a new presence on the planet that will cause trouble, mm. right? Um, and so that's the story of Yakub. Now, so that's the theological framework of this of understanding the existence of suffering, and then why this is so grounded in science makes some sense because. Uh, in the you know in the early late 1900s uh, late 19th century late 1800s early 20th century in the United States you have scientists who give birth to the idea of eugenics right the notion of classifying people by you know what we now know to be biologically false racial categories and using this categorization to make assessments on who uh, were more advanced and who were the, the quote unquote more perfected people and who were the lesser populations. You know, there was the application of Darwin's theory of evolution to uh, explain social dynamics. So the existence of, of disparities in wealth and outcomes was explained away were explained away as like, oh, these people were just not fit to survive, right? Um, so you have all of this in, in American science accepted, widely accepted as legitimate science. No one is questioning it. No one is saying this is crazy. No one is saying it is bunk, right? So here comes Elijah Muhammad or Farad Muhammad and Elijah Muhammad with their own counter narrative that is, you know, also framed in scientific terms that says, hey, you know, no, it's actually not, you know, where like white people are at the top. They they invert the 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 hierarchical ladder and say, no, you know, um, you came from us and we were the original mm -hmm. people. And as the original people, yeah. we have a greater claim to if there is a claim to superiority, we are the ones that have that claim because you are the lesser of and, us. And I think, uh, sorry, sorry, go on, finish your point. No, so, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, we of course, and so the, the thing is, we accept the development of eugenics. And I mean, like really 
you know, like they're sci- they're buildings at, named after these scientists in major universities in, in the United States, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we accept their flaws and faults as part of the progress of scientific knowledge, but we we don't delegit- delegitimize them, um, even though they gave rise to, in fact, the, you know, Hitler's idea of eugenics and master race theories came from American scientists, Right. And so, you know, this is in the 1920s, 30s and 40s. So in that context, you have another uh, idea that is framed around scientific knowledge or the claim to scientific knowledge uh, and offering a very different scientific framework or, you know, again, science in quotes. But but if we're going to put the Nation of Islam science in quotes, we got to put the, mm-hmm. the scientist science of in course. quotes. And I think that that's the that's one of the, I think one of the most important things that you had had theologically black people were explained as having been the result of a curse. Right. Um, the, the what people call the Hamitic curse, where, you know, Ham was one of the sons of Noah, who, because they made mockery of Noah, he was cursed so that he and his children and his descendants would be the servants of his brother's descendants. Right. So you have theologically um, this imposition of black inferiority. You have scientifically this imposition of black inferiority. Um, and then you have the historical reality that the Western world had wrecked havoc uh, with all of the encounters they had had with indigenous people around the planet. And so into, into this, you have, of course, the history of black people in America as as a people who had been um, subject to white supremacy in the church, white supremacy in science, white supremacy in the culture that had devalued all of the aesthetic and very, you know, uh, uh, real attributes of, of who they were. And so, of course, someone who comes with this framework and says, no, 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 no. Not only are you, uh, those same. people aren't, those people aren't your equal. Yeah, those you're, people you're aren't the yeah. those people aren't the people to you know you you don't you shouldn't aspire to be those people because mm. look at what those people have done right you you are better than them right um, and this kind of um, message resonated you know Elijah Muhammad wasn't the first person to call white people devils. David Walker in eighteen in eighteen twenties, who was an abolitionist, wrote this, you know, something called an appeal to the colored citizens. Um, and, and he he called white people devils for practicing slavery. So this idea of of devil, which I think a lot of people are like, oh my God, how could you? Like it's it's not that deep. You know, in fact the but, but I, so I, I was gonna say yeah. so when you when you again it's all about context, when you contextualize it um at the time um and you look at the backdrop of of slavery you look at um all, all the, the crimes that have taken place and the and the the, the race motivated right. murders and, and whatever else that were happening at the time it's not a far stretch i think for for someone to accept that notion and i think also what's what's significant and what kind of comes across in the autobiography and also like you know um looking at uh the the, the life of malcolm x is that what the Nation of Islam were providing at the time was a, a as you say, a very robust counter-narrative, but also like socio-economic upliftment. Um, alongside that, there was this whole like health regiment of like, no, we do not drink. You know, we are better than this. Yeah. And, and there was yeah. this, this, this feeling, I think, at least of, of self-worth um, that, that African-Americans maybe did not have for a long time, which is why the message resonated. And, and my thinking, at least on that, is that, you know, if, for example, I have to accept some possibly a bit loopy notions as I might see it, I'll take that because the rest of it is all good and it's all positive and it's all for the community, if, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. And I think one of the things that the Nation of Islam demonstrates is the power of institutions um, yeah. and the institutionalization of and mo- ideas. No, but mo- mobilization as well. Yeah. Right? I, I mean, as a collective, there's so much potential. Yeah. So like, I mean, the reason why narratives stick is like what makes a narrative recept, what makes people receptive to a story and what makes that story stick. Right. Yeah. And you know, a social crisis can open people up to thinking differently. Um, but unless you have a structure, an institutional structure and an institutional capacity to like put those ideas into practice, mm. it's not going to stick. And um, to your point, 
you know, this was something that I think um, many people who study Malcolm, again, because they don't look at like what I would call his social history. They don't look at the history of the, the communities that he was a part of and how those communities informed him as much as he informed them. I mean, you know, yes, I think Malcolm had tremendous leadership capacity and ability that he demonstrated as, as a minister in the Nation of Islam, you know, that he served from 1952 to 1964, which 12 years of his life. Um, but he also did that in the capacity of an institution that made that possible, right? And so I think, you know, the the idea that just a, a word will transform you, I think we're, we're sometimes, I think, and I think people who are scholars and intellectuals tend to be very romantic about, a little overly romantic about the power of the word. Similarly, I think religious teachers do the same. Like, just say the Shahada and your life is going to change. Mm. Uh, no, it's not. If there isn't a community to support my acculturation into what the Shahada means, right? If there aren't people who are going to help me on this journey, if there aren't you know, places where I can eat the foods that I'm supposed to eat, or go to the you know new forms of entertainment or new kinds mm -hmm. of ritual practices that will help me take the place of the bad practices right and so i think that you what you see in the story of malcolm is in the story of a community the importance of putting in place the institutional framework for an idea like that an idea alone a speech alone is just only going to go so far Right. Um, that if you are not in community with people, if you aren't working with people, if there isn't a structure, then you're just not going to have that. And I think, you know, like Malcolm, you know, is incarcerated when he first encounters the teachings of the Nation of Islam and incarceration imposes a kind of regimen, a kind of discipline on someone's life because you're told when you have to get up, you're told when you're supposed to eat, you're told when you get to go outside, you're told like everything about your life is controlled. And I'm by no means am I, you know, bigging up the prisons, mm. but I am talking about a kind of discipline. A great friend of mine and colleague, Garrett Felber, who wrote a book called Those Those Who Know Don't Say, he looks at the role of the Nation of Islam in organizing against prisons. Um, and he, he, he talks about this thing that he calls a dialectic of discipline, that discipline can be used uh, by the state as a form of punishment, but within the nation of Islam, discipline was used as a form of empowerment, right? Um, and so the discipline that the nation of Islam introduces to Malcolm, I guess, absolute value, uh, you know, ab ab abstractly, looks kind of like a same the same kind of social controls that he may have had in prison, but it's put to a very different use, right? Um, and so there is this regimen of like exercise, of eating healthy, of dressing in a certain way, of, you know, they are, and as they were growing in how they practiced uh, prayer, but regular prayer, which included wake, which included waking up in the morning uh, during the time of Fajr. And okay, if, you know, if, I, if yeah. I can just jump in for a second, arguably, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same uh, argument you can put forward for Islam as well. Like the Absolutely. fasting that we have, the praying that we have. Absolutely. It, it's all fundamental, like fundamentally, it's just discipline. Um, it is, but, but, and but you know when you being when put you use yeah being put and, to good use essentially yeah, and when you it's funny when you like um, you know so like I when you read when you read critics of Islam right um, people are like oh it's an overly legalistic religion mm -hmm. right like there's it's not spiritual enough right and and we know like in in, in Abrahamic traditions um, you know we we. Or at least I think of Moses or the books of Moses as bringing the law, right? So Moses brought the Ten Commandments, right? Um, which represents the legalistic aspect of religion, right? Yeah. Um, and Jesus, you know, he said, I didn't come to change the prophet Easter peace behind him. I'm just, I'm just alternating Jesus and, you know, the, um, <laughs> I, I know who they are. It's all right. Okay, good, good. I hope your <laughs> listeners do too. I think they do. Um, but he, Jesus is spoken of as um, not having brought a new law, but the fulfillment of the law. And very much, much of, of Prophet Isa's ministry is about the heart, right? It's about, you know, how you think, right? So it's like, you know, the he who has thought of sin might as well committed it, right? So there's the idea that having the law alone without the spirit of love it can result in hypocrisy, 
right? Mm-hmm. Where people are just externally um, performing rituals, but in their heart, they don't, they don't believe, right? And so with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we get like the two. So if you think of like the legal aspect of, um, of religion as like this horizontal plane, you know, and then you yeah. think of the spiritual aspect of religion as this like vertical plane, then, you know, so like Moses is the law, Jesus is the love, and Muhammad is sort of like that balance between the two, like a diagonal line that balances the legalistic obligations of religion with the spiritual faith that has to be a part of it. At least that's how I've always so uh, I, I, thought I of that. I think, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting quite far off topic here, but- We are, inter- No, this we is really interesting, but, but I, I think what, for, for me at least- <laughs> Bring it back, bring it back. No, I, I, I've got a segue, don't worry, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> but w- what I wanted to say is that I think the problem that we have in today's kind of communities is yeah. that we as individuals are too legalistic minded when it comes to religion. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's the one nice thing I've seen at least around uh, Islam is that like, you know, Muslims predominantly, even, you know, uh, Muslims that aren't that religious will either not drink alcohol or not eat pork as like a thing, even though they don't do anything else. But that's right. like, you know, there's, there's right. certain boundaries. But I think that, you know, we've unfortunately also kind of moved away from um, the, the tradition when it comes to the spiritual element and, as you say, the love and everything else. Right. Um, but but that's just the unfortunate reality. Now, coming back, I don't have a natural segue. So well, I, gonna... I, I think I can bring it back to Malcolm. <laughs> OK, go ahead. I think. I think no, I, I, but I do want to. The thing is, I, I want to move the conversation on as well. That's why. I, yeah, I wanna... yeah, yeah. No, I think that's fine. Um, so specifically, I think part of Malcolm's like many people struggle, I think part of Malcolm's struggle Mm. is that, you know, Malcolm was that kind of, you know, Malcolm was, you know, he was both this sort of political thinker who was very much concerned with the material realities of the people of, uh, in the, you know, with the people, but he was also a spiritual seeker, right? And I think, Mm. you know, that, that sort of, attention is inherent in his work and i think there's this there's in 1960 there is an audio recording of a meeting that the nation of islam held in harlem new york and in that meeting elijah muhammad's son wallace uh he was then called minister wallace muhammad he would later become imam warthuddin muhammad who in 1975 succeeded his father as leader of the nation of islam and moved the majority of its members towards um, a a more sunni expression of islam but in 1960 so there's a whole 15 years earlier in 1960 wallace is, is speaking at this nation of islam gathering and he describes the salat in full detail and and by the sound of the recording because he goes off mic at some point it's he's demonstrating this a lot because he's talking about and you go down on your you know, like he and you bow down and then you say you know you come up and you say subhan like he's doing the whole thing and this is in 1960 at a nation of islam meeting and then he he makes sitched up because you can hear like his his voice yeah. trails off and in the background As Minister Wallace is explaining the prayer, you can hear Malcolm X saying, that's right, teach. That's right, brother minister. So Malcolm, as early as 1960, was exposed to the teaching of Salat in the Nation of Islam. Mm. Now, what's really interesting is that when when Minister Wallace is finished with his, his lecture, Malcolm comes up and Malcolm says, What Minister Wallace taught you was the spiritual aspect of Islam. I'm here to teach you the political aspect of Islam. Because until we get our political situation together, we can't really appreciate, I'm paraphrasing, we can't really appreciate the spiritual wealth that is found in Islam. And so Malcolm was very much aware of this, um, of both. Yeah. This sort of material and spiritual balance that religion has to satisfy. That if your religion is not able to transform your material conditions, then why do you, why do you believe it? Right? Like that's why he that was his critique of Christianity. Right? Um, 
But he was also what I what I think the story introduces is Malcolm was also already knowledgeable about and people in the nation of Islam were not all already already knowledgeable about what we would consider Sunni ritual practices, yeah. but actually were doing them. Maybe they weren't doing them in like a massive public way, but they were doing them. And so this complicates the narrative that people have about Malcolm where he isn't quote unquote a real Muslim until he leaves the nation of Islam and makes the pilgrimage, right? Now so Malcolm you, Malcolm yeah. contributes to this narrative himself because remember, as I said, he has different, he has like one interpretation of his life when he's in the nation and when he's out of the nation, he's trying to reinterpret his past. And so he emphasizes certain things and de-emphasizes other things. And one of the things he wants to emphasize is like, I'm not like them anymore. And they're not even real Muslim. I mean, he goes goes hard against the nation of Islam. And in so doing, um, as every interpretive you know, act entails, there are things that we emphasize, there are things we de-emphasize, there are things we really don't talk about. But I think that this complicates our understanding of the sort of neat you know, breaks and epiphanies in which we understand and try to divide up Malcolm's like, oh, that's Detroit Red, or that's Malcolm X, or that's al Haj Malik. Uh, this is one singular person moving through these timelines, and it's really not a clean break from the past. So this is, uh, I mean, you you segued fantastically uh, because this is this is what I did want to get onto. I feel like you read my mind there, but but you know, looking at um understanding the 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 different versions of malcolm um and and also how you know how he's perceived by people today because coming back to a more you know contemporary lens i feel like malcolm x is an individual as i said that you will see those pictures you will see the quotes and for a lot of people that's as deep as the connection goes that's as deep as the understanding goes but i've always found it interesting to kind of understand um what people understand of Malcolm X and what he represents because um, you you have people who will constantly when they think of Malcolm X think about um, if I can just use the term rage against the machine you know anti-establishment um, uh, being critical towards those in power and and that's like a that, that's a sentiment that resonates with a lot of people very strongly but for me, with Malcolm X comes a lot of the, the civil rights stuff and, and a lot of conversations around race and, and a lot of problems that persist in today's society and in, in Muslim communities today. But that's kind of left by the wayside. When we talk about Malcolm X, when we think about what he represents, he's seen as, um, as I said, a, a, a fi an anti-establishment figurehead. And, and, and people like that. That's comfortable. That's safe. But what's not very safe, as you said, is that when you really unpack Malcolm X's life and what he represents and what he stands for, there's there's a lot of messaging in there that's quite strong um, and, and for some people might be uncomfortable. But how, and I guess to, to kind of flip the question onto yourself a little bit as well, how do you um, perceive Malcolm X today? Like what, 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 what legacy has he left behind for you um, that makes him important? I mean, to the point that you've dedicated large chunks of your life to to studying and teaching um and, and really getting under his skin like you're reading off dates and times as if you were there um but how how, how like you know what what does yeah. he mean for you yeah um so i think uh the way i'd approach that question is thinking about so there's there's a there's still this powerful individual right um tremendously brave courageous with you know, deep integrity um, and intellectual honesty. Um, at least that's what I also I'm projecting on him, right? Yeah. I think that there, you know, there the stuff that I talked about, like how he he himself is doing a sort of narrative revision along the process, doesn't take away from any of that. But I think this this uh, this humility. Um, you know, people would call it epistemological humility, or just like this the sense of knowing what you don't know. Um, and understanding the limits of your knowledge so that you are always wanting to learn more. Uh, Malcolm was a voracious reader. He was always like trying to learn more. People who encountered him talked about his inquisitiveness and the ways that he asked questions. Um, he was always trying to learn. And I, I find that incredibly 
um, inspiring to, to, to just hold that. Um, so just as that, that personal, you know, the, the personal Malcolm, but more powerfully, and I think this is where you get into greater demands, like, cause we could all like do that sort of neoliberal self-help Malcolm as a self-help book, right? The autobiography of Malcolm X is a self-help book, like how to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, whatever that may be, and be like a better person. And, you know, that's why people like, Barack Obama and Clarence Thomas have talked about like Malcolm X is their hero because they, this personal transformation. But it wasn't just personal transformation. It was a, it was an abiding love for a community of people, right? So now we're talking about some social responsibilities and obligations to be in community with people. And then from that, so personal strength, integrity, morality, discipline, being in community with people, right, which requires a kind of um, establishing social relations and equitable kinds of, of conduct with people. And then from that community perspective, um, being very clear and critical about the ways that the powers of the state can be abused uh, to uh, you know, bring harm to yourself and to your community. And so those are the three ways that I think about Malcolm. I think, yeah, this first is just like, what does this mean for me? Like, how should I be living my life? You know, what are the things that I should be doing to improve myself? And then two, uh, what are the communities of people that I'm finding myself in? And how are we working together to just create a better existence for more than just one person? And then three, what are the ways that we can mobilize that in order to impact, you know, and counter the harmful policies of of the state. Um, so those, I think, are the three things that, you know, like individual wellness, community wellness, and really, you know, societal wellness. I think that's how I understand Malcolm. I think, um, you know, there, there are many ways that people come to Malcolm. And I, I think the power of Malcolm is that he is much um, he's an effective inviter, right? Like it's an invitation to think more, hopefully. Uh, but, you know, people people will like, some people will just stop with the individual, like this is like a cute story of transformation. And I think, you know, coming back to why Malcolm resisted doing an autobiography is that he didn't want the story to be about him. Um, he wanted the story to be about the people. And the, the genre of autobiography, of course, is very much about a single individual. And in the context of, of Black autobiographies, um, there's always this challenge of how can you be an example of the people without being made an exception from the people, right? Mm. And that's the, the force of white supremacy will there's like this this threshold. So like while you are below the threshold of quote unquote success, you are an example of quote unquote failure. And once you surpass that threshold and become quote unquote successful, you can no longer be an example. You must be an exception. Right. And that has nothing to do with that person. That has something to do about the um sustainability of white supremacy and, and you know that white supremacy is is made unstable by examples of success that don't fit into that framework right do you still so you see that as prevalent today that oh framework? yeah i mean look at like you know anytime people like talking about like the struggles that black people go through people are like but you got oprah winfrey and you got you know like they they will articulate these people as examples but they're, you know, they're, they're this like example and, ex and exceptions at the same time, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that we should, and I don't, I don't even know if this is a Malcolm quote, but I, I feel like it comes in the spirit of Malcolm. We should always think of ourselves and our social standing by the, the person who is regarded the quote unquote least of these. Right. 
um, you know, this is the, this is the story of Jesus, you know, when his disciples came to him and they were like, when did you need this thing that we didn't do for you? Like we did all these things for you. And he says to them, not until you have done unto the least of these, have you done unto me? It's the same thing with prophet Muhammad. You know, a, a believer is not a believer until he wants for his brother, what he wants for himself. Right. Um, and of course we can expand that. And so I think the idea is, um, you know, there's still that that threshold, like how many examples do you need to break the ceiling of white supremacy? Right. Um, and I think that's an ongoing battle. And I mean, break it, not like symbolically surpass it, but I mean, actually break the ceiling itself, not be like, not say like, oh, there's a crack in the ceiling that people can go through, but say like the ceiling doesn't exist. And so I think, you know, but to it, me, I, I think that I, I mean, we're now transitioning to a more contemporary conversation, yeah, yeah. But, but that for me comes down to dismantling an entire system and infrastructure not just breaking through a ceiling because there's there's so many systematic changes that would need to be made to, to actually rewire the system right no absolutely and um, so for me the ceiling was was a symbolic of the system so there's yeah. you know do you do you have this critique of like a systemic analysis versus um, an individual story and i think the the challenge with um, studying someone like malcolm x is to hold both of those things together and and I, I guess you know one more thing or one one more question for yourself on on this particular uh, line of thought. Do you think that post um, Malcolm X's assassination, uh, do, do you think that the work that he was doing in his lifetime has stagnated or or not progressed at the same pace as it as it was at the time? Well, I think since Malcolm's assassination, there are, I guess, many ways to look at the legacy of his work. Um, I think institutionally, that legacy is fractured. Um, some of that legacy is represented in the Nation of Islam that continues after his assassination, that becomes transformed in 1975 under Imam Warathuddin Muhammad. Um, and continues with that community. And some of it is revived under the Nation of Islam under Minister Louis Farrakhan. Um, some of that legacy is carried on by the Black Panther Party. Some of that legacy is carried on by the Black Arts Poets, who in, in many ways are the, you know, the ancestors of, of hip hop, um, who carry some of that legacy. I think some of that legacy is carried by um, the scholars who were touched or moved by Malcolm. Um, you know, um, ev everyone ranging from, um, you know, people like Tariq Ali, who was one of the students who invited, was part of the student group that invited Malcolm when he came to Oxford, right? And Tariq mm. Ali is like this leading Marxist scholar now, right? But there was, um, so the, the reason I'm asking that is because I, I feel like there was a certain veracity um, at, at, in the way that he did things and there was like a pace and a momentum it felt like well you know I, I say this but you know reading the book it felt like there was there was real momentum and movement and and potential for for things to happen um, and and at the same time I look around and and you know with the events of um, the, the, was it last summer George Floyd yeah um, and and the Black Lives Matter movement everything that's happened like I I, I look at um, what's what they've done in the uk so now before football matches players will take a knee um symbolically in in, in support of the movement but it that's that's about as far as it's gone like as, as i said because because for me it's beyond the social media symbolic stuff there needs to be some sort of systematic change and this is something that malcolm x i believe was working towards albeit in a very radical way yeah um but but the 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 it's been decades um, yeah. Do you know what I well, mean? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, so Malcolm wasn't able to reconstitute his work in in a viable institution that survived him. Right. Um, mm. And I think that that, you know, so part of this is a critique that we might bring to Malcolm, um, who, you know, understood the or anticipated the shortness of his own life. I mean, he he did have this impending sense he foresaw that, it, his, yeah. that his life was going to be cut short. So so like you know so this is let's say this is the this is the the space that people have to cover right. And so like the society and the community is moving at like this pace right because they have time right. 
multiple generations have time. Here's Malcolm, and he's like, I got to cover this distance in like a much shorter period of time. And generations from now, um, and people will look back at what I did in April of 1964 and say like let's let's get the lessons from that generations from then people will look back at what i did in november of 1964 and get this i i have to finish this thing faster than people can follow me i think that is what we see in the last 11 months of malcolm's life is just just like i just got it i just got to get this i have to get to my finish line which is not your finish line right and mm-hmm. i think that you know for people who are interested in movement like that's the important thing to understand and it doesn't it isn't to slight malcolm but it is to say you know like malcolm's life is not the ceiling it's the floor it's what we stand and move on it's not the extent of how far we have to go and so yeah we we and many people have to pick up the baton and there is no inst- like i said the institutional legacies of malcolm are fractured so there isn't like this one place that you can point to to say like oh they're really continuing the work of malcolm there are people who have picked up pieces of malcolm and that they feel speaks and aligns with whatever they're doing and they're working on it but there is no like one place to say like here's malcolm's legacy and then i also think it's unfair to put that on malcolm or any historical figure right like that is our responsibility no but we, that's what we, i mean I, I i i'm not putting that on him i believe yeah that, yeah, I, yeah i don't think we've picked up the mantle essentially is what i'm trying to say yeah i mean i i don't know i think that there are some people who are working really hard in the context of what we're working in so this comes back to how we open this conversation about history um you know historians conventionally say you have to wait a generation before you can really assess a thing right mm-hmm. and so um you know how we think about what's happening today might not be how we think about what's happening today in 10 years Right. So we may see like, oh, the kneeling, you know, that's just symbolic hogwash. Like, can we move it, beyond it that? It could be the tipping but point to something. It could be. It yeah, could be yeah. representative because you think of the 1968 Olympics in Mexico mm. where um, Juan Carlos and I forgot the two others who did, you know, did, you yeah, know yeah. put their fists up um, at the time. Did we all we I wasn't there to be sure. But at the time, did people know what that meant? Right. And then when you pull back and you put that in context of the Black Panther Party, you put that in context of James Brown's Say It It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. You pull, you know, like you put put in the context of the Black Arts Movement and, you know, like there there are things that we aren't able to see because we're in it. And I Mm -hmm. think as we get distance, we might be able to see more clearly. So I'm, I'm a little bit more graceful um in in my yeah, patience me. with then you uh, but that doesn't but that same but that doesn't mean because you know look um malcolm didn't wait for historical analysis of his current moment to act so i'm not saying that we need to wait 10 years to yeah, decide yeah. what we should be doing now we should all just be acting but be acting with i think the humility um, you know, that that history, one of the lessons of history is to be really humble about what you're doing. You can speak boldly, you can speak assertively. Um, but, you know, and I think as Muslims, we are, we're always cognizant that there is something much bigger than we are. There's yeah. time that's much grander on a scale than we are. Like there's always something bigger. So we should just be, you know, just a little humble. Uh, I'm not saying you aren't, but I, I think sometimes um, the desire and yearning to see something better so quickly, um, you know, gives a voice to um, not just a, a voice of urgency, but sometimes a, a sharp critical voice that I, I am I am learning myself to to sort of keep in check. And I, you know, I think in in fairness, if we were to look at Malcolm, because I'm. I mean, I don't believe in a hagiography of like a saint story of Malcolm. I think we can also learn from the things that Malcolm maybe didn't do so well. Mm. And Malcolm was harsh. Um, You know, I think, you know, he talked about his contemporaries sometimes in the harshest terms um, that, you know, I don't think we need that. Right. Like, I don't think we necessarily have to do that. I think that there are ways to, you know, to be critical, but I think the greatest form of critical of of uh, the greatest form of critique is work. 
you know, if you think someone is doing something that you think is wrong, put an example of the counter, uh, the, 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 the other way of doing it. Um, and, and if you can't, you know, we have that, that hadith and like, if you see something wrong, you know, try to stop it, you know, physically, if yeah. you can't stop it, speak about it. If you can't speak about it, think about it. And so we have degrees of action. Like you act, you speak, and you think. And thinking is the weakest version of critique. And we got a lot of that happening. Um, <laughs> we also have a lot of speaking happening, but yeah. we don't have a lot of the action. action. Yeah. The, the, there's one thing um, just b before we close out. You mentioned, and, and I, I've actually written it down, I think it was a epistemological humility yeah was the term that you used and 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 for me personally reflecting on 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 the autobiography and and my experience of that i think one of the biggest takeaways was just this uh, i was i was amazed at the fact that at every point in malcolm x's life he was so sure of himself he was so sure of himself as detroit red as um you know the one of the top guys in the nation of islam but when he, his, his heart was kind of always open, as you said, right, being open to embracing truth, whatever that might mean, whatever. And, and also the bravery that it takes, you know, to be in an organization like the Nation of Islam. We talked about how rigid an organization it was and how the rules were there. And even when he was chastised and told not to speak, um, he held his tongue for, for a, a longer amount of time than I think many could. I mean, you look at Donald Trump, for example, couldn't keep away from his own Twitter account. Um, for, for, for long enough at any period in his tenure um, but it just shows how difficult it is you know when you have that platform and everybody wants you to say something right um, that that discipline but but alongside that was that kind of willingness to embrace whatever he found to be true and 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 take with it the consequences um, be them what they may uh, I, I think that for me at least was kind of the the biggest lesson and and, and like i said it's as, as as cliche as it unfortunately sounds the, the the book and and studying malcolm x's life and and really kind of um trying to get under his skin a little bit and and understanding him um is quite an uplifting experience like you said you know it, it can be seen in like a in a neoliberal way as like a personal development motivational book whatever but there's so many different facets to it mm -hmm. um that i think it's as i said the reason why i wanted to have this conversation in the first place and, and you won't believe when i first completed reading the book i was like oh i need to do a podcast on this but i don't know who to approach and then i think we we we, we bumped into each other in like a clubhouse room uh, a few months ago <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then and then you followed me on twitter and then i kind of uh, looked at your bio and i was like okay this is the guy um and and yeah I'm, I'm glad we got to do this because you know there's so much more we can talk about oh for sure um but 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 i think you know for people just to have like an elementary um level one understanding of the complexities around this and and i guess the reason why you've dedicated so much of your time and, and people always talk about Mark Max's autobiography and him as an individual. Um, there's so much for people to study, learn and, and, and benefit from. So I, I guess, thank you for, for sharing um, a little bit with us today. Well, well, thank you for having me. And I, I know we didn't exhaust even all of the topics that we had we on really our didn't. list, <laughs> but you know, that just, that just goes to show how deeply rich uh, Malcolm's story is and his legacy and, um, I, you know, there is a reason why the book is regarded as one of the top 10 books of the 20th century by Time magazine. It is the reason why um, so many people have, um, you know, started there. So many people's journeys have included or started from this book. And so even if people come to it and their their only takeaway is about their own personal development, if that personal development is in you know located or situated within an anti-racist framework then go for it right <laughs> <laughs> go for it um and i think you know i i think a lot about this idea of of, of epistemological humility which i encountered i can't remember where i encountered so it's not my my phrase i'm gonna um, credit you with it no please away. don't i don't <laughs> i'm very much about like crediting people but i think one of the reasons why i like it is this you know you, you don't have to be you can be bold and still be humble, 
right? And you can be strong and still be humble. And I think there's a there's a um, a misreading of humility as meekness or weakness. And um, when it comes especially to knowledge, you know, Malcolm, I, I once interviewed one of his secretaries and she said, you know, Malcolm would, you know, he, he took me, we would go to the library and he had a list of books that he wanted to check out. And he would get these books and he would highlight passages like what kind of books was he, Malcolm checking out at the library? And she's like, oh, at the time he wanted all of these books on slavery. Right. And he would he would highlight passages or copy, have her copy down passages from these books that he would incorporate in his lectures. And. You know, like that was just amazing to hear, you know, like Malcolm at the library, you know, um, someone who we you, like many of us see as just sort of self-contained, you know, autodidact, like just like this person is a fountain of knowledge. But this person is at the library checking out books. Right. This person <laughs> is reading. He's studying. He's asking yeah. questions. And, and that it is because of what his humility gives him access to that he can then step to the microphone and speak with such boldness with such confidence with such assurity that you know powerfully moves us right and i think that that's that that interesting balance between being a simultaneous student and teacher right that you you're never just one um you know and even me as as a teacher um in class i'm always cognizant of like how can i learn from my students right what can they teach me and there is a deep and significant power in having that kind of presence as well and so i think as much as you know malcolm was not a know-it-all and he never presented himself as a know-it-all and that is why people connected with him because they saw in him their sincerity they saw in him their desire to learn they saw in him this quest for freedom and i think that is that is like the powerful embodiment that he was awesome well thank you very much uh really really enjoyed this and and i hope we get to do it again sometime i'm um, happy to thank you